So we're going back to diseases. This is bacterial diseases. This particular disease here is on elms, which of course you may have come across a lot of issues on elms. They do tend to have problems. This is bacterial leaf scorch, which is a bacterial disease. So bacteria are single cell organisms. They can increase in number in a very short period of time and then when they clump together in masses, you call it a colony. So they obtain food from dead or decaying ma organic matter or living tissue. They spread plant to plant by wind driven rain and they gain entrance through natural plant openings or injuries. So the way they survive, some of them are, or most of them, are epiphytes on plant surfaces. They're just kind of hanging out there. They're not really doing anything. They're not taking anything from the plant. And then saprophytic on decaying organic matter. So they obtain their food by absorbing uh, the dissolved organic matter. And then there's a resting stage. So they can enter ho host through stomata, lenticels, hydathode, that's what we have the picture here, this little pore-like structures at the end of leaves. And this is guttation happening here. Through wounds, abrasion from wind, soil particles, of course, pruning, animals, rain, insects, and other pathogens. And here's a close-up on the stoma with a great grapefruit leaf with bacteria entering the stoma. So you can see they're very tiny. So when you're comparing the two, fungi are not going to have a water-soaked uh, appearance. Uh, the, we're mostly talking about leaf spots here. The texture for fungi would be dry or papery. Bacteria would be slimy or sticky. Patterns of Fungal leaf spots tend to be circular like a target. Bacteria tend to be irregular and angular and usually don't start off crossing the veins. They will eventually. Color change, uh, red, yellow, purple halos, uncommon in bacteria, although we will see some coming up here that have yellow hal halos on them. Fruiting structures, very uncommon for bacteria. Fruiting structures such as mycelium and spores for fungi. and Tissue disintegration is uncommon in fungi and common in bacteria. So Stewart's wilt is a disease that you'll see on corn. So if you take a section of a corn leaf that has symptoms and drop it in water on a microscope slide, you'll see this bacterial streaming. And this is with a compound microscope and it's Erwinia stewardii. You may also see this sign. Uh, this is a bacterial wilt in cucumbers and that group of plants. So the sticky strands of bacterial ooze become evident as you cut the stem and you pull them apart. Also caused by Erwinia. There's a lot of species of Erwinia bacterial diseases. diseases. Okay, so we've got crown gall here on the upper left. That is on apple rootstock. Then we've got a bacterial leaf spot on lettuce. And then bacterial canker on the right here on bing cherries. So symptoms include soft rot, and that's actually the name of the disease. And the way you're going to know that this is a bacterial disease is it's going to have a horrible odor to it. On the right, we've got a bell, bell pepper with bacterial wilt. You'll also see this on potatoes and tomatoes. Sometimes you'll see this witch's broom appearance on trees that have bacterial disease. On the right, I was talking about some of the yellow halos you might see on leaf spots. This is a uh, xanthomonas on a zinnia But you can see it's got angular spots and they tend to be along the veins. Okay, crown gall disease can happen on ornamental plants, fruit trees, and cane berries. 
most commonly found on cherry, apple, peach, pear, plum, euonymus, rose, raspberry, and blackberry. It can s spread through soil water, and this is what it looks like on euonymus fortuni. It's a soil-borne bacterium. It comes in through wounds on the crown and roots. The galls start out fleshy and white, and the picture we have here, this is a crown gall on apple. It's an older gall, so it's hardened and it turns brown, and it can range in size from less than an inch to several inches across. So on the left, here's a smaller crown gall, but you see on the right, there's actually a very large crown gall, and it's not at the base of the plant. So um, you would have this analyzed by a lab, obviously, to determine what the problem is, but uh, I would say that that plant needs to come out. I got to think uh, anything growing above that gall is hazardous. Here it is on Euonymus. Also Fortuni, so be on the lookout there, and uh, there's some on campus. Hopefully, um, if you're on campus at any point, check it out. But you can see the upper gall here is white, so it's kind of, uh, it's a young gall, but then below we've got an older gall. Uh, this plant's a goner. So it's important to avoid injuries to the bark, crown, and roots while planting. You don't want to replant susceptible species in infected soil. If you can prune out the gall, you can try, but you want to make sure your cuts are well below the damage. And then, of course, sterilize your pruning tools between cuts. You want to remove and destroy declining trees that have these large crown galls like we saw in the previous slide. Remove the roots and surrounding soil if you can. And then you could try this Agrobacterium radiobacter strain K84 gall trawl to prevent infection. It's not going to cure it, but you could dip roots and crowns um, before planting anything into these infected soils. Okay, lilac blight, you may start to see this out there, Pseudomonas syringae, and don't let it fool you. This is a disease that gets more than lilacs, but you can see the tips are all black. Starts as brown spots on stems and leaves of young shoots. They may have a yellow halo, and then they become black and grow rapidly. So here's some advanced damage here. Here's some more damage, and you can see this kind of shepherd's crook. That's one indicator of Pseudomonas on that lower picture. It also affects pear, blueberries, cherries, maples, and many other woody plants. It may resemble fire blight, uh, probably more common on this side of the mountains than fire blight is, however. It overwinters on diseased twigs um, or stems as epiphytes on healthy wood. And uh, if you're going to, this is, this is something that definitely needs to be cut down. You're not going to be able to salvage this. Management includes air circulation. You prune out and destroy all affected tissues immediately. And when you do this, you want to go at least six inches below damage. Do not fertilize late in the growing season and don't over fertilize young plants. They become more susceptible. And in the spring, protect from rain and frost in hoop houses.